Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So uh, what I'll be talking about is how we can actually get to what we heard about this morning, level four and level five of conversational AI, and how we can actually do that, what needs to be done. Uh, but let me start off by giving you a little bit of uh, context, my background. Um, I've built several technology companies over the years, and I've also developed several technology platforms, including um, programming, programming languages and database systems, also ERP system. Uh, actually, my ERP company was very successful, we went from the garage to 400 people and did an IPO, so that was very nice. And it's really that that enabled me to say, what is the big problem that I want to tackle that bothers me? And what struck me is that software is really stupid. And I say that, you know, being very proud of the software that I've developed, but software can't think and reason, it can't learn, it doesn't have common sense, so how can we solve that problem? And so I spent five years doing my own research and really studying up on what intelligence entails, what is cognition, uh, what do IQ tests measure, uh, how do children learn, how, does, how is our intelligence different from animal intelligence? Um, and of course, what had been done in AI to try and build thinking machines? So over that five-year period, I came up with a design, um, with various design ideas to do that, and uh, I, I then formed a company, an R&D company, in 2001 because to ten, turn my ideas into actual code and into platforms. So for several years, for another five years, we were just in R&D mode, basically figuring out how to build thinking machines. In 2001, I actually also coined the term artificial general intelligence together with two other people, and we wrote a book on, on the topic, and it's kind of nice to see that this term is now uh, quite commonly used to refer to, to truly thinking machines. Um, so by 2008, we had enough of, of the uh, technology together that um, I actually launched a company um, in the IVR space, automating calls in the call center that, you know, as we've heard many times, we all know people hate it when they call into a company and they have to talk to a computer. They just press zero to get to an operator. Well, we provide a much better experience uh, with smart action. Uh, you can speak in natural language right through the conversation. So it can start off by saying, how can I help you? Uh, right through the conversation, it understands natural language. And we've been doing that for 10 years now. Um, if you break down the side of the road and you're a AAA member, chances are our first generation, IAGO, will actually help you uh, get going again. Um, how, however, I've found that um, um, I, I exited the company five years ago to really focus on taking the technology to the next level, um, to be able to handle a wider range of uh, conversations and more complex conversations. Um, so th there's a huge demand for, um, for, for truly intelligent, personalized conversation, both as a user interface to devices and also as a, a personal assistant. Um, um, so, um, you know, we've, as we've been talking to, to customers, we, we see uh, there's tremendous interest in, in all sorts of different areas. You know, some of the obvious ones are the help desk. In education, if you have a robot in a hospital or hotel, you obviously want to be able to talk to it and you expect it to, to understand you. Uh, automotive, you, you, know, you want to be able to talk to your car and, and expect it to understand you. Uh, v, VR, AR. Uh, very obvious applications where you need voice interaction, but you need something that understands you. Uh, in the middle, that refers to a sort of a co-pilot application uh, to, to, to be able to talk to software so that you can just uh, talk to your you know, Oracle or SAP or whatever software or your Salesforce software and say, uh, you know, give me the sales for the last three months uh, by product in Europe and it should be able to understand you and then say, always show this to me as a, as a pie chart and it should remember that. It should also have a memory that you can say, run that cash flow report you did for me last week and it might then come back and say, Igor might come back and say, do you mean the one for Nevada or the one for California? I think there's tremendous demand uh, for this kind of thing. Um, however, we're not there yet. Why don't we have that? Um, now, bots handle simple applications really well, as we've heard quite a few applications that are, that are running well. 
but there are also really serious limitations. And to concretize it, we, I have a little snippet here of the market leader, generally recognized as a market leader, uh, Alexa, uh, trying to do some relatively straightforward things. All right. Alexa, Alexa, add chips and guac, napkins, and three bottles of wine to John's birthday list. I added chips, guac, napkins, three bottles of wine to your shopping list. Actually, Alexa, remove the napkins from the list. To clear your list or remove an item, visit the Alexa app. Okay, then. Alexa, what do I have on John's birthday list? You have one item on your shopping list. Chips, guac, napkins, three bottles of wine. Call all that one item. Oh, Alexa, remember that John's favorite cake is red velvet. I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about what the limitations are there. Um, now, I'll show you um, our technology hooked up to the Alexa microphone speaker. Creating John's birthday list. Is that okay? Yep. I added chips and guacamole, napkins, and three bottles of wine to John's birthday list. What was the food on that list again? Chips and guacamole and three bottles of wine. Actually, let's make that five bottles. Sure. The list is now five bottles of wine, chips and guacamole and napkins. Great, let's send it over to June. And ask her if there's anything I'm missing, please. Sending John's birthday list to June via email. Oh, oh, wait, uh, always contact June by Skype. Okay, sending the list to June via Skype. Oh, remember that John's favorite cake is red velvet. Got it. Fantastic. This is not a mock-up. Um, but I also didn't show you the blooper reel. Um, so I go, if I doesn't understand something, it'll ask, what is guac? Guac's the same as guacamole. It will now learn that and remem remember that. Um, and, um, you know, it, it can reason about things. What are the food items on the list? And use context to, say, make that five bottles and then learn simple things like always contact June by Skype and John's f uh, favorite cake is red velvet. And this is a very general capability to be able to learn and reason and disambiguate on the fly. Now, uh, why don't we have this technology available uh, generally? And I generally say it's kind of a, an accident of history that um, the current deep learning, machine learning technology has been so successful that it sort of sucked all the oxygen out of the air, and that's what everybody's working on. Let's just throw more data at it, more processing power. But it's not going to solve the problem. Um, because the current uh, chatbots offered by all the major suppliers, pl plus the hundreds of uh, almost all of the, uh, the, the other small companies offering them, really suffer from some severe limitations, cognitive limitations. They don't remember what you said five minutes ago, never mind what you said last week. Um, they cannot learn interactively unless they were specifically programmed to, to listen for something. Uh, they don't have deep understanding. Uh, because they just do statistical pattern matching. So if you say, I hate Uber, don't ever give me Uber again, chances are it will still trigger the Uber, uh, Uber app. Um, so there's no reasoning, so you can't really have a, a, a conversation and they're not um, personalized. Now, the, the reason for that is uh, we, we can find that in what DARPA calls um, um, the, the third wave of AI. Now, the current technology that everybody, or almost everybody is using, essentially is a categorizer, a big fat categorizer. You collect a whole lot of data, you tag it, you train the categorizer, and then you write little flowcharty type programs, uh, essentially, uh, to, to, to have the conversation, conversation flows. Um, and, you know, the, the, the limitations are, are fairly obvious with that approach. Um, now, the way to overcome that is to really um, move to a different approach of technology. Um, so DARPA talks about the th three waves of, of AI. Uh, first wave is good old-fashioned AI, uh, basically logic programming, expert systems, so on. We know we can't overcome, um, you know, we can't handle conversations through flowcharts alone. So then the second wave, um, 
you know, promised to kind of solve that and, um, you know, has been tremendously successful in a number of areas in speech recognition, uh, image recognition, and, and so on. Um, and, you know, taking a lot of data and basically building statistical models uh, from that. How, however, it's also become clear that the limitations of that are quite fundamental and severe to the extent that the godfather of deep learning uh, a year or so ago said, my view is to throw it all away and start over. Even the head of um, uh, deep, deep Mind just a few months ago said, deep learning is an amazing technology, but definitely not enough to solve AI, not by a long shot. These are pretty strong indictments against uh, uh, deep learning by itself. So what is the third wave? The third wave is basically uh, building something that works more the way our brain or our mind works. It, it's a cognitive architecture where the components of cognition are all represented and working together in concert. Uh, so that reasoning and memory and learning and uh, parsing and all of those work together, work against your long-term memory, your short-term memory and your context. And this is what I figured out some 15 plus years ago. And this is a technology we've developed, commercialized, and perfected um, to, um, uh, to, to achieve that in a highly integrated way, working against a very high performance knowledge graph. Um, so this is what allows us to give much deeper understanding to have the short term memory, uh, one shot learning, zero shot learning, to have reasoning uh, and to be able to handle real conversations. Now, natural language is really hard, as any, you know, I think pretty much all of you will, will know. I don't have time to, to go through a lot of the problems here, but let, let me just use one example of just how, uh, how far away we are with chatbots. I can have a conversation with a five-year-old child uh, with just six words, my sister's cat Spock is pregnant. And a five-year-old child will have no difficulty in understanding, Peter is speaking, I have a sister, my sister has a cat, the cat's name is Spock, you might think it's male, you hear it's pregnant, now you know it's female. And we take that for granted. Uh, current chatbot technology couldn't come anywhere near that uh, as you know, a, a general ability to learn and, and, and understand. Um, but that's really what we need. Um, so uh, the difference is really like chalk and cheese. The current approaches um, of chatbots, they are trained offline, uh, and then the, the, the model is deployed essentially as a read-only model. Um, training data is very large, um, whereas with a third wave approach, you're working with an ontology. You teach the system general skills and knowledge that are used for all applications. Um, no reasoning, and also they are black boxes. So when something goes wrong, your remedy is really to throw more data at it and hope that it, you don't have catastrophic forgetting. Uh, with cognitive architecture, you can actually zero in on what the issue is and you, you can fix it more reliably. I just want to talk about, um, with the approach of having a cognitive core, that has a lot of cognitive ability, that has memory and reasoning and a knowledge base and all of that, you can create all of those applications basically by adding the application-specific layer that you need. You start off with a core, a strong cognitive core that already knows about people and places and how to hold a conversation. And then for every specific application, you We'll add the application layer, the, the blue layer here, with potentially with uh, additional ontologies and APIs to the backend system. The green layer represents what each individual user teaches the system or what the system learns from each individual user. Uh, I think that's all I have time for, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Thank you. One question. Thank you very much. One question. So it's really cool because it seems like you're far out ahead of where most in the industry, if not all of them are. What are you struggling to tackle right now? What problem seems unsolvable to you guys right now? So um, 
we are a long way from human level AI. Normally, if I had to kind of put it on a scale, I would say, you know, the best chatbots, I mean, if you put them an IQ 10, I don't know, I mean, IQ is not the right measure. We may be at 25 with all the additional cognitive ability, long way from, uh, from true human. So common sense knowledge and reasoning, having knowledge about the world is really, really hard to capture in, uh, in a system, especially in a system uh, that isn't grounded, you know, isn't a robot. And, and of course, involving robotics makes, a, makes the AI problem even harder, having to deal with robots. So it's really uh, the common sense knowledge and, and, and reasoning that are the, the, the biggest problem. And of course, we're, we're a very small team. We're only 12, 12 people in the company right now. We, we just just gone commercial with the second generation of our technology now. So, you know, it, it's not going to be solved by a dozen people. Thank you very much. Round of applause.